it's, it's great to be here. Uh, I'll, I'll wait as, as people are moving over. Um, I, I'm going to talk a lot about U.S. data and do my best to make it relate to the Israeli experience. But in many cases, Israel looks very different from the U.S. Obviously, geographically, it couldn't be more uh, apart. But there are also many ways in which the Israeli market appears healthier than the U.S. labor market does right now. And that's something, as I prepared for the talk, really, really struck me. And I think, I think we should come back to that uh, later on. Um, let me start with a picture of the United States. Here I've taken the 3,000 odd counties in the United States and I've ordered them on the basis of their density level. Because at their heart, cities are the absence of physical space between people and firms. Cities are density, proximity, closeness. Um, what you see in the blue line there is the relationship between earnings uh, and density across America. The densest tenth of America's counties have on average incomes that are 50% higher than the least dense half of America's counties. This is something economists call agglomeration economies, the fact that we become more productive when we are thrown into a maelstrom of economic activity like the greater Tel Aviv uh, area. Um, there's, of course, other reasons why incomes are higher in, in dense areas. One reason is that sometimes more productive people just choose to live in cities. Certainly, you know, New Yorkers like to believe that it's, it's all them, it's not the city. Uh, but um, sometimes there are exogenous things like access to a port or a coal mine that both induce people to locate in the area and make them more productive. But I think it's fair to summarize the vast literature on agglomeration economies as suggesting that some sizable portion of this effect is actually the treatment effect of cities. And one of the facts that you should know about this is that when people come to dense areas, right, they don't see their wages leap up overnight. Instead, year by year, month by month, they experience faster wage growth, which is compatible with the view that cities are forges of human capital, places where people become smart by being around other smart people. Um, the top line shows the relationship between population growth between 2000 and 2010 uh, and initial population density. And what you can see is that in the US, at least, there was very much a tilt towards the center. Right, as uh, Eric was suggesting. Um, population was not moving to the vast empty spaces between the oceans as it once did in the 19th century, but instead of spreading out at the start of the 21st century, we're clustering in. Um, this is very different from the New York City of my youth, right? So I was born in the island of Manhattan in 1967, and I lived through a period in which it seemed like places like New York were headed for the trash heap of history. And the backdrop for that was not just the social chaos, the rising crime rates, the fiscal uh, unsteadiness of the city government, but behind all of that lay a massive deindustrialization. The largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s was not automobile production in Detroit. It was garment production in New York City. And the garment industry was walloped by globalization in the 1960s to the tune that you know, half a million jobs were lost in a short number of years. And indeed, when I started thinking about these cities, uh, thinking about cities, th working on these topics in the early 1990s, right, the techno seers, the cyber prophets, were predicting that the technology of the 1980s, right, the, in the ability to use fax machines, and remember that high-tech one, uh, the these things would make face-to-face -face contact and the cities uh, that facilitate that contact obsolete. And yet, that didn't happen, right? And uh, they didn't seem to kill urban finance. It didn't seem to kill urban technology. And we see that all around us here as well, right? That it's not as if the tech firms in Israel are moving off into the desert and just disconnecting from everything. They're, they want to be there. They want to be, we just heard, you know, the, the, the challenges of being next to highly productive neighbors, but, you know, uh, in terms of Via's choices. But it's also clearly an advantage to be part of this cluster of, of intellectual success, where, as Alfred Marshall wrote 100 30 years ago, in dense clusters, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air. And we see this both in, in terms of finance. Actually, Michael Bloomberg, this is Bloomberg's city hall. Michael Bloomberg, of course, is not a financial billionaire. He's actually an IT billionaire. Um, but his story, in some sense, illustrates the power of cities, because the reason why he's able to compete so successfully in the IT space with Silicon Valley is that he has knowledge that no software engineer in Silicon Valley has, because he's actually run the trading floor at Solomon Brothers. And he He's actually you know, run their tech operation. When he starts his startup in 1982, he has knowledge that the city has given him that enables him to build the machines that the traders at Merrill Lynch want on their, on their desks. I, I also highlight this Wallace office, which is also part of the story, that indeed you know, that Wallace office is based on the, the Wallace office at Bloomberg LLP, which is based on the Solomon Brothers trading floor. And trading floors 
are in some sense bizarre, because here you have some of the wealthiest people on the planet who normally should have vast offices. But on trading, off, trading floors, they sit right next to each other, listening to each other yell, listening to each other scream. Why are they doing that? Why are they putting up with all the discomfort? Well, it's obvious, right? It's because in that industry, knowledge is more important than space, right? And it, it is precisely that because knowledge is more important than space that cities have come back. That in fact what happened is that globalization and new technologies vastly increased the returns to being smart and we are a social species that becomes smart by being around other smart people. In a more complicated world, the easier it is for ideas to get lost in translation. Right? Anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject material, it's knowing whether or not your students are getting anything that you're saying. Okay, uh, and we have these cues as human beings that it, we've evolved over millions of years for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another. Physical proximity makes it possible to transfer ever denser, ever more complicated ideas, and that's increasingly valuable in our world. Right, and in some sense that explains why you know you think of all the companies in the world that should manage long distance working, it should be Google. Right? Uh, you know, they enable all of us to connect uh, over continents, over, over uh, oceans. And yet, does Google tell everyone to go home and just dial it in? No, far from it. They, they buy the Googleplex. They buy a million and a half square feet in downtown Manhattan because they know that proximity and the exchange of ideas is the life's blood of creativity. Now, this, of course, has led to a highly uneven urban landscape in the United States. Right? There are some cities like Detroit, St. Louis, Cleveland that are still mired in poverty and joblessness and there are other places that have come back, not just New York, soaring from the dark days of the 1970s. It's easy to forget now, but in 1971, two jokers put up a billboard on the highway leaving Seattle asking the last person to leave the city to please turn out the lights. Right? Because just as no one could imagine a Detroit with a smaller General Motors, no one could imagine a Seattle with a smaller Boeing. And Boeing had been cutting back on jobs you know, before Amazon, before Costco, before Starbucks, before Microsoft. All of these entrepreneurs created this startup city that was ultimately built on education. And indeed, when you look across America's cities, this is the share of adults with college degrees on the x-axis and per capita GDP on the y-axis, right? Education is the secret sauce that explains which cities do well and which cities do poorly. This is obviously not just the link between education and individual success, but what economists call human capital externalities, the fact that we become more productive when we're surrounded by other smart people. A typical estimate from the work of Enrico Moretti finds that as the share of adults in your metropolitan area with a college degree goes up by 10%, your earnings typically go up by 10% as well, holding your years of schooling constant. I want, though, you to highlight two things relative to Israel on this. I mean, I will show you again Eric's numbers, but look at this range, OK? Detroit, I mean, this is the metropolitan area. In the city of Detroit, only 13% of Detroit's adults have college degrees. More than 50% of Seattle's adults have college degrees. This is a much larger gap than you saw in any of Eric's numbers between, between regions in, in Israel. And also, similar, look at the income graph between places which have per capita GDPs in the low 20s to places which have per capita GDPs above, above 80, right? America just has enormous diversity in this. Um, this is the relationship between education and population growth between 2000 and 2010. The most educated metropolitan areas are labeled with five. They're growing extremely well. The least educated ones, they're all fairly flat, right? Population has moved to the areas that are more productive. Now, sometimes we talk about entrepreneurship as culture. Right? As, as was mentioned uh, by uh, Avi, right? we, we all came from the University of Chicago. All of us sat at the feet of Gary Becker at one point in time. I like to think of it as one special form of human capital. Right? There's just a thing which is entrepreneurial human capital, which is, a, uh, which is part of, of our skills. It happens to be an enormously valuable form of human capital, not just in terms of personal earnings, but in terms of the success of place. And certainly, it plays an outsized role in Israel's success. 50 years ago, the economist Benjamin Chinitz was comparing New York and Pittsburgh and noting that New York was more resilient than Pittsburgh was even then. He argued that this was a legacy of New York's garment industry, an industry that was a mother of entrepreneurship because it was an industry in which anyone with a good idea and a couple of sewing machines could get started. And those entrepreneurs, because entrepreneurial human capital is remarkably fungible. Those, human, those entrepreneurs went on to found movie studios, to build skyscrapers, to open banks, to do different things. Because if you're good at looking for new opportunities in one sector, you bring that skill with you to another sector. By contrast, Pittsburgh, because of its coal mines, had US steel, had the steel industry. Vast, vertically integrated company that trained company men, not entrepreneurs. 
And while those company men were remarkably productive at solving the short-run logistics problems that U.S. Steel faced, they were remarkably bad at envisioning some sort of a new future uh, when U.S. Steel faltered. It is remarkable, given how mediocre our measures of, human, of entrepreneurial human capital are, that they do such a good job of predicting urban success. So one of those places with the smallest establishment size is five of the places with the biggest establishment sizes. This is a fourfold difference in employment growth across metropolitan areas between those places that have the most little firms versus the, the fewest big firms. I often say that you know, the, secret to, the secrets to urban success rest on small firms, smart people, and connections to the outside world. This was true 200 years ago in the age of Matthew Bolton's Birmingham or Alexander Hamilton's New York, and it still is true today. This fact, by the way, you know, holds true within cities, within industries, any way you want to cut it, it's very strong. Now, everything that I've said so far is absolutely as relevant for Israel than for, for the United States, right? The, the fact that Israel is successful depends to a very large degree on a combination of education and entrepreneurship. These are, these are things which are absolutely crucial in terms of thinking about the startup nation. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it just doesn't feel that different to me. Um, Israel also feels like pockets of New York, right? Pockets, pockets of, of the US, San Francisco, Seattle, um, New York. There are lots of things in common with the Israeli economy. But there are great swaths of America that look and feel totally different. And in some sense, there's a way to think about this which relates to Gene's, Gene's blimp and the lower economy. New York, Boston, San Francisco also have a blimp and a lower economy, right? They also go together. And I'll come back to, again, differences between those, those areas. But when you go to West Virginia, when you go to other areas, right, there's no blimp. It's just a lower economy trying to get by on its own. And the consequences of that are dire. Okay? Now, perhaps the most striking fact for, for the US, and here I cannot emphasize enough to, to which Israel just looks much better, not just in the US, but most of, of the other rich world successful economies. Right? A, a defining feature of the US economy, perhaps America's largest unsolved social problem, is the declining rate of male employment. When I was born in 1967, 5% of prime age males were prime ages defined between, as being between the ages of 25 and 54. I should say, by the way, as I creep towards that 54-year-old limit, I'm finding that definition increasingly uh, uh, offensive. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, but um, the, the, that decline, so 5% in 1967, for most of the last decade, more than 15% of America's prime age males have been jobless. And you can see this is the EPOP ratio. This is the share of Americans. You can see it's, it's down, been down below 85% for much of the past decade. Right? We're below Australia, France, UK, Canada, and Germany, although all of them have seen those declines. Um, these declines are not spatially neutral. Okay? The top two lines show the jobless rate for in major and lesser metropolitan areas. The blue line shows joblessness for non-metropolitan areas. And this is the point, right? When you have a lower economy without a blimp to hold it up, without demand for the services that people provide, really bad things can happen. And if you think about a future without low-skilled industrial employment, this is a global challenge, right? Without a high-tech sector, without a high-skilled sector that actually exports, which can provide services which provide jobs for less skilled people, right? It's very, very hard to imagine what those lower-skilled people are going to do. Um, this is what America looks like as a consequence of this. So this is joblessness throughout the US. And the dark areas have joblessness rates for prime age males that are greater than 26%. Okay? More than one in four prime age males in this great swath that begins down in Louisiana and Mississippi, runs up through Appalachia, and then ends up in the cities of the, of the eastern heartland. Right? This eastern heartland area is the epicenter of American social distress. Right? And it looks like nothing that I've seen in the Israeli data. It's just, it's just a different thing and a, worse, and a worse thing. And it's very different than what America looked like in 1980. So these are the same graphs that you see for, for 1980. It's just a much lower, uh, much lower joblessness rate. There's still peaks in Appalachia, but it's, it's a very different world that we live in today, just going back. And for women, it also looks very different. Women looks much more like a north-south difference. And I focus on male labor force participation just because female labor force participation is a very different thing culturally. And it, it can feel similar in some cases, but often it feels quite different. It is just as important. It's just more complex. Um, this eastern heartland doesn't just show up in terms of joblessness. It shows off this is opioid consumption, which is a current American curse. These are opioid deaths. It runs together. And if you want to ask yourself where the, this fact that Anne Case and Angus Deaton have identified of the end to improving health in, in prime age men, that's also in the eastern heartland. That's where those decreases in health have happened. This is incarceration rates. 
this skews a little bit more towards the, towards the deep south. Right? So this is the share of Americans that are in jail. Um, this is the per federal government expenditure per capita. Again, the federal government ends up spending much more in this eastern heartland area because of the cost of social programs. Um, and it's not that hard to understand why the eastern heartland looks so bad. It's a combination of human capital and institutions, which I think is always the, the linchpin of economic success. So the eastern heartland has much less education than other areas. That reflects two things, one of which is its industrial past has created a hangover because those industrial jobs didn't require a lot of education, so they didn't invest in schooling. And then you also have the Jim Crow South, which because of the legacy of American apartheid, invested very little in its public schooling uh, as well. Um, it also is a place where corruption runs. So these, this is a measure of corruption, which is federal judgments against local officials. Again, the areas of the Eastern Heartland are the places in America in which the local governments are the most dysfunctional. Um, I highlight joblessness. Because, and I, I want to make this point before getting back to Israel and place-based policies. Um, this is life satisfaction. Um, in, in economics, we've often highlighted inequality. Uh, and inequality certainly is not a, not a great thing, but it is far less bad thing than joblessness. And there are many ways of talking about this, but one way is to use the life satisfaction numbers. So what these figures show, if I look at men who are earning more than $50,000 a year, 2% of them say that they are unsatisfied with their lives. 35 to 50,000, 4% say they're unhappy with their lives. Earning less than 35,000, 6% say they're unhappy with their lives. Jobless, 18% say that they're unhappy with their lives. It's a quantum leap upwards. Because, of course, life satisfaction, happiness, is not just about earnings. In fact, it's not even to a very significant degree about earnings. It's about a sense of purpose, a sense of social connection. And when you take those jobless men who are also living alone, right, you're getting unhappiness rates that are 30% or more, right? Uh, so this is really a high degree of misery. Um, now, one last point about joblessness before I, I return to Israel. Um, sometimes you'll read articles in the New York Times about you know, how great it is that there's a guy who has stopped working in order to take care of his family, doing what women who don't work typically do. And that's one of the reasons why men and women are different. Because if you look at the time use of women who are out of the labor force, they're actually caring for others. They're you know, taking care of the family. They're doing a fair amount of socially productive things. What are men doing who are out of work? Well, it's really easy to see it. They're watching TV. Okay, they're, they're watching five hours of television a day, five hours a day on average, okay? Uh, now, apparently, this does not lead to happiness, but it is an absolutely staggering number. They're also sleeping a bit more, and what they're not, look at the caring for others number, how many extra, as, as, you, as they work 360 minutes less, as they work six hours less a day, how many of those minutes go into caring for others? Nine. Nine extra minutes a day are these men thing. So banish the view that all of these jobless men are actually caring for their families in some kind of a meaningful, uh, meaningful way. Now, uh, I, I, don't have, I, I don't have a lot to add to what, was, what, what Eric just gave you about uh, Israel and geography. Um, the, the population concentration, of course, in this central area is quite striking. Right? That's, of course, one of the things that you take away from uh, this data. And that population density is also associated, as it is in the United States, with earnings and with education. This is the uh, daily traffic volume. Of course, that's the slight downside of population density. And I, I often highlight that there are also demons that come with density, uh, among them contagious disease if you don't have a strong public health system, crime if you don't have a just, strong justice system. And the one thing that all dense areas in the world suffer from, whether or not it's Kinshasa or San Francisco, is terrible traffic. And apparently, you even have this in Israel uh, as well. <laughs> uh, these are uh, Eric's numbers. And again, these show sort of differences, just like you have in the US, the employment share gaps are very, very small relative to the US. And these are his numbers for differences in share in college graduates. These differences between 22% and 37%, they're real, they're significant, but they're just much less wide. It's, it's just uh, the, the spatial heterogeneity is just much less than in the United States. And that's, that's sort of a starting point. Um, now, do these geographic differences call for major league place-based policies? that support the poorly performing areas? Or do they call for policies that enable people to get out of the poorly performing areas? Right? Both views are, in principle, tenable. Um, one view, the older view, is, is that we really need to sort of channel aid into poorer areas. Um, this aid view emphasizes either that it's a matter of justice, that there's some form of, you know, we, we want to help poor, poor places because that's a good way of helping poor people. Um, the counter view to that is maybe we should just target our aid based on the poverty of the individual, not on the place. Um, 
And then there's an added question. Is, should that aid just be extra checks? Should we just give people checks based on, on how poorly their region is performing? Should we have policies that differ? Or maybe we should just invest in infrastructure, like transportation, which we think will somehow or other enable these places to get better. Um, the exit view depends a lot on how high migration rates. And I'll come back to this in a second. But the, the US has typically been a country that is very much on the move. And consequently, Americans tended to believe very strongly that there was an exit option that existed for, for Americans that should be supported. Europeans, by contrast, were much more fixed. And so that pushed against this view. Um, if you think that exit is a viable strategy in Israel, uh, if you think that moving to Tel Aviv is the viable option, then that pushes you to thinking that maybe the most important place-based policy is to make sure that it's easy to permit and to build affordable housing in the Tel Aviv area. That, in fact, that may be the best way to help people who are uh, poor and living in other areas. There's also a view that says that you, know, you don't need to do anything, that low incomes are typically offset by low housing prices uh, or positive amenities, and the right answer is to do, uh, is to do nothing. Now, when you think about the panoply of place-based policies that are available, um, there are sort of four that I want to highlight that we see out there, one of which is direct public investment, typically in some form of infrastructure, often transportation infrastructure, that can either be explicitly spatial. So the Tennessee Valley Authority was meant to bring electricity to an area that was disadvantaged in the 1930s. Current work on this suggests that it was actually wildly successful. Um, probably wildly successful because it wasn't originally designed as a place-based policy. It was designed as an electricity policy. And it was understood that it had direct payoffs in terms of electricity. By contrast, the Appalachian Regional Commission, which also had a very heavy infrastructure uh, approach, focused on building roads in Appalachia. And while it seems the data is sort of more mixed, there's some evidence that suggests that there was a short run bump up. But certainly, if you look at Appalachia today, there's no huge benefit that was created by, the, by generating those highways in the area. Um, it's, it still remains deeply dysfunctional. Tax benefits or grants to businesses, right? So there's a new markets tax credit program in the US. There's the, there have been long benefits for moving your businesses into the Mezzogiorno in southern Italy. Uh, so those are explicit spatial policies. Uh, there are also implicit policies which have spatial effects, right? So the interstate highway system in the US decentralized people from cities. The work of Nate Baum Snow finds that each highway that cut into a metropolitan core reduced the central city's population by about 18% relative to uh, the metropolitan area a as a whole. Um, agricultural subsidies or agricultural pr protection, which is certainly an Israeli policy, this has the, po has the effect of moving people to agricultural areas away from urban areas. Tax benefits or grants for individuals. This tends to be less common. Um, typically, long, narrow countries like Norway or Chile like to make sure that people live on their edges so that other countries don't grab bits of those edges. Uh, so Chile and, and Norway, for example, have long had policies encouraging people to move to, to their edges. Um, and finally, there are also implicit policies. Flood insurance isn't explicitly spatial, but it sure encourages Americans to move to flood zones, right? which is not a particularly sensible thing for American, American policy to do. Uh, finally, regulatory relief. Um, you know, for example, the Chinese special economic zones, which were very successful uh, in terms of generating business growth, what they allowed was sort of a targeted area where you could have relatively free market policies within greater China. And this ended up being highly productive. An example which seems probably more relevant for the Israeli model is when they closed down a military base in Fort Devens, Massachusetts, they, in they initiated what the Devens Economic Commission, which enabled one-stop permitting for new businesses within, within Devens. OK, so with that taxonomy in mind, let me give you the five traditional fears that economists have had about any place-based policies. Right? First of all, subsidizing declining places keeps people in dysfunctional local economies. So after Hurricane Katrina, I was very skeptical about using vast numbers of money to make sure that pe poor people continue to stay in New Orleans. Because as far as I could tell, New Orleans has been doing a terrible job taking care of its poor residents for the last 50 years, and it seemed like a somewhat crazy thing to do that. And indeed, the work of Bruce Sacerdotes finds that those poor kids who relocated after Katrina ended up with significantly better educational outcomes than those poor kids who stayed in Katrina, stayed in New Orleans. Um, subsidizing any places leads to capitalization in rents. So for example, you build the Bilbao uh, Guggenheim Museum, rents go up nearby, how does that help a poor resident of Bilbao who has no interest in contemporary art, right? You've made that person's life worse off, not better off as a result. Um, the relative importance of capitalization versus distorting migration depends upon housing supply elasticity. One of the things that's important is that declining cities have, have relatively fixed numbers of housing, which is in some sense why they remain for so long, even if they're after their economic engine has departed, like Detroit. 
Um, when really poorly designed, place-based policies can create pockets of high unemployment and low human capital. So East St. Louis was on the Illinois side of the border within the St. Louis metropolitan area and consequently had higher welfare payments prior to 1996. That meant that if you were poor and on welfare, you naturally wanted to move to East St. Louis from the mainstream of St. Louis. Right? This made East St. Louis the poorest part of the United States. Um, finally, infrastructure-based policies, particularly when generated not by ordinary hard cost-benefit analysis, but when justified by some place-making magic, can generate monumental, say, uh, monumental waste. OK, so five observations now about place-making. First of all, place is a pretty weak tag for poverty. By tag, I mean the correlation between place and poverty is pretty weak, which means that helping poor people is typically a lot more functional, a lot more targeting than helping poor places. Two, agglomeration economies, which I mentioned beforehand, can be seen as being a justification for building up particular areas. Okay, But even if we know that agglomeration economies exist, we don't know if that means we should move people from Tel Aviv to the desert or from the de desert to Tel Aviv. It's not clear. Right? Maybe you're going to be creating enough of an agglomeration in the desert for this to work, but maybe you're, you're taking something away from Tel Aviv, which has a larger cost. Three, infrastructure's labor demand impact is often modest, and cost-benefit analysis typically favors infrastructure in high-demand places more than in low-demand places. Um, housing policy, which is always a critical part of placemaking, needs to avoid the twin devils of both nimbyism and monumentalism. And the strongest case for place-based policies is not spatial subsidy, but rather targeting policies to reflect local conditions. OK, um, so externalities in place-based policies. Uh, agglomeration economies and human capital externalities, as I mentioned earlier, are generally accepted. This means that the free market is unlikely to get it right, OK? Because these externalities mean that just people making decisions don't necessarily mean that everything works correctly. However, and this is the sort of a point that I've, I've cannot emphasize strongly enough, just because the free market gets it wrong doesn't mean that the government will get it right, OK? And, and in fact, it's very hard to know what policies that you would put in place that would actually correct for this. And as a, as a scientist who spent my life studying this, I feel like I have no confidence whatsoever of knowing whether or not I should be moving activity from one place in, to another in terms of minimizing these things. Um, two, you know, redistribution and place-based policies. In 1969, Detroit was slightly richer than Boston. Today, Boston is 40% richer than Detroit. Does that mean that I should engage in some form of local insurance against Detroit's shocks? The economic answer is if I could create a really well-crafted insurance policy that takes care of you know, kids born in Detroit, then you know, there would be welfare gains from that. But in fact, they would be quite limited because states only explain 1.2% of income variability. Right? Most of the variability is at the individual level, not at the state level. In fact, smaller areas only explain 7.1% of the income variability. So you're not getting a huge, you know, you want to, if you want to insure people against inequality, do it with something about, about in terms of income and social insurance. You don't want to necessarily target these places which are so poorly correlated with these, these things. Um, and also, obviously, income declines are offset by housing cost declines, which means if you're a renter, yes, you earn less in Detroit, but you also get to pay less for rent. If you're an owner, you lose on both margins. This just shows income change and housing price change. Right? These two things go quite closely together. So you do get the benefit, if you're living in Detroit, of having, of having lower housing costs. Now, infrastructure. Um, infrastructure is often put forward as the panacea for declining places. What you know, your underdeveloped place needs is more roads or more trains or something like that. And um, this is an area in which we have seen over and over again colossal errors. This is one of my favorite one of those errors. This is Detroit's people, move, people mover monorail, okay, which was part one of these six monorail, so six uh, train systems that were authorized by the Federal Highway Aid Act of 1973. Right? You will notice that it glides over empty streets. Notice the streets below? Empty, because it's Detroit. It was a city built for 1.85 million people. It now has less than half of that number of people. Um, you can run a bus at any speed you want down central city Detroit. And yet, because of this infrastructure focus, um, we ended up having rails in a place that we didn't, we didn't have any particular need for it. Um, this is a more general phenomenon, right? That, that this happens all over the place. And it happens often when we follow something which is, uh, you know, sometimes we're trying to hit declining areas. Sometimes we have a vision that, you know, build it and they will come. So we sink massive amounts of rail infrastructure and, and we hope that something good will happen. Uh, there's a better solution for that. If you really want to try the build it and we will come, do it with hyper fast bus lanes on dedicated roads because you can shut down the buses if they don't actually show up. So the flexibility of buses give them, give them a tremendous advantage in this. Um, 
This shows the tendency to build. This is, was our attempt to reboot the American economy with infrastructure during the Great Recession. As you can see, what happened was we ended up spending a lot more in low density areas relative to high density areas. That's the nature of American politics. Um, it turned out actually during the Great Recession that during this period, those, the places that we targeted were actually the places with the lowest unemployment rates. And we spent the least in the places that had the highest unemployment rates consequently as a result of this. Um, and we also spent the least in the places that had the longest commutes. Okay, so we actually targeted the infrastructure spending to the place that needed it least. And this is, often comes out of infrastructure spending that is meant either to fight a recession or to cause placemaking. That instead of delivering uh, infrastructure where it's needed, it, it doesn't actually deliver anything. Um, we also know from the ARA that you know, $1 million gener generates an extra four or five jobs at most at the local level. So it actually isn't a great job making enterprise either. Um, this is Bill Bao, Bill Bao, which I mentioned earlier. Bill Bao is seen as being a great success in terms of using cultural infrastructure to cause a place to, to research. Uh, I should have, remember the last time I looked at this data, Bill Bao's unemployment rate was 19%. Okay? So while it may have done wonderful things for real estate values near the museum, it has not done a great deal in terms of helping the poor in Bill Bao. But at least that's a muse good museum. Uh, this one, Sheffield's National Center for Public Music, is more representative of trying to use cultural institutions to bring areas back. Um, this closed within the year. Uh, and as some sort of a community center at some point in time. Now, when we think about infrastructure more generally or about housing policy, there are two great dangers. There's a Scylla and a Charybdis of nimbyism, which is not in my backyardism, opposition to growth, and monumentalism, building for the sake of building. Okay? I'm using Mumbai, okay, which has, in 1968, uh, embraced the British Town and Country Planning Act as their basic rule, which mandated a maximum height of 1.25 floor area ratio, which means you can build to an average height of 1.25 stories. Now, anything, there's, there's the word Town and Country Planning Act should tip you off as to the error. Anything that's appropriate in rural England, in Dorset or, or Somerset, uh, will be wildly inappropriate for Mumbai. And yet, you know, too often we are rooted in the past in terms of housing policy that is opposed to delivering density. And one of the things that I worry most about, you know, the future of Tel Aviv and transportation connections is that you will not allow enough high-rise building to be built around and near the train stops. Right? These train stops will be an enormous, are an enormous asset, but only if you allow there to be enough density that is built around those, those areas. And you know, the greatest model for financing infrastructure that I know of is Hong Kong's mass transit, in which they finance the rails by building skyscrapers on top of the rails. This is a great model, and it's one that's actually self-financing. Self um, now, there's another error, which is Astana, right, which is building for the sake of building, right, which is monumentalism, and it's equally as stupid. Uh, okay, now. Um, I'm not going to say a lot on this, but permitting is important. Cities only grow if you build units there, right? When you see a place that isn't growing by as much as you'd like, or you see a place where housing prices seem too high, the first place to ask yourself is, are we permitting enough housing? Okay, this is just a way of looking at this. Along here, you have the supply of housing, which is the number of permits issued between 2000 and 2013, divided by the 2000 housing stock. Here is the difference between housing prices and the marginal physical cost of construction. So what this means is that houses in San Francisco are valued at three times of what it costs to build those houses physically. Okay? That reflects the fact that it is enormously difficult to build in San Francisco. Ask yourself, is, is Tel Aviv making it easy enough to build the space for the entrepreneurs of the future? It's one thing for sort of Gene to figure out how to educate all of them. But when they're, when they're actually educated, are they actually going to be able to find a convenient apartment where they don't have to commute for two hours uh, into, into whatever tech company? This just shows more permits, more higher prices across US cities. Um, I, I, this is China. Uh, China is also an example of a certain amount of monumentalism. This is the level of Chinese building during its boom, which lasted from 2003 to 2012 relative to US building. Right? China built massively more than the US. And they have massive amounts of empty space in interior cities. Okay, so this is billions. This is a total inventory as of 2015. This is 10 billion square feet of empty space that the developers are holding on their books. Okay, meaning that, that the developers just build it and don't sell it. This actually doesn't happen in the US because the developers have creditors who actually force them to sell it. But in China, the creditors are state banks. They go along with it. And they've built a massive amount of space without, uh, without, um, uh, without being able to sell it. Um, America is largely nimbyist, and we do, when we do overbuild, and we certainly did overbuild in Las Vegas and Phoenix during the height of the boom, that really reflects private folly, not public policy. Okay? Uh, 
Um, China is monumentalist, which reflects a, a planning objective of building up peripheral cities. Again, China has this, this goal to build up the periphery, and it has been associated with massive amounts of overbuilding and underuse and waste in terms of, of spending, and often some ill-conceived incentives. Local officials try to boost the local economy by building up, uh, even if no one buys. Um, Israel is certainly nimbiest uh, in, in Tel Aviv in some areas. Arguably, it's also monumentalist in other areas, possibly as a substitute for building in, in the area where the demand is hottest. Um, and one reasonable response to income differences is to allow more building in Tel Aviv and some in San Francisco. OK, um, I, have a, I have a few more minutes. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about how US, the US has changed and how the US world and how I've gotten to be sort of more open to at least some place-based policies in the US than I was 10 years ago. Um, so here, here's how the US has changed. So first of all, we've stopped being a nation on the move. For 40 years before 1992, more than 6% of the United States population changed counties in every year. Over the last decade, never more than 4% of Americans have changed counties. That's a one-third decline in migration rates. That's a tremendous change in America that we don't fully understand. Um, Migration has also stopped being targeted. So whereas prior to 1980s, poor Americans moved to richer areas, that has stopped, possibly because we have stopped building in richer areas, possibly because of other factors as well. So about 30% of those jobless men live on their parents' couches. Okay, they, live, they live with their parents. And unfortunately, their parents are not willing to move to San Francisco, uh, even if that's where the jobs are. Um, uh, the, there's a, been an enormous tendency, and you saw this in Eric's work, of areas that started with a slight skill advantage to get an even more skill advantage. The complementarity across people with skills is enormously strong in the 21st century. And this causes initial, initial gaps to widen over time and skill. And income convergence has almost ceased at the metropolitan level. So for 140 years, between 1840 and 1980, places that were richer had slower per capita income growth. Places that were poorer had faster income growth. This fact was documented most famously by the work of Robert Barrow and Javier Sally Martin 25 years ago. But apparently, the income convergence process stopped almost exactly when Robert Barrow documented it. Uh, and we really have seen that cease to, uh, cease to occur. Um, and one argument for this is it's both a combination of the, the end of directed migration, the end of poor people leaving poor places to move to rich places, but also the fact that in, in an industrial economy, it made sense to move a factory to where there are low wage workers. In the 21st century service economy, you're not going to move your tech firm to West Virginia because there are no skilled people. And no one in the tech firm is going to think it's a good idea to move to West Virginia because you can get a cheaper haircut and a cheaper nanny. Right? It's, not a, it's not, a, not a sensible thing to do. That means that you have an increasing tendency of uh, places to be deeply persistent. So um, instead of having unemployment rates uh, or non-working rates even out over time, um, this is the non-working rate in 1980. This is the non-working rate in 2010. The correlation is over 80%. The, the coefficient is more than one, meaning that it's sort of an exploding process. We're developing permanent pockets of joblessness. This just shows how income convergence has basically stopped, uh, that it's flat now instead of being strongly negative. And this shows that if you this shows the relationship between skill, the skills of migrants, which is along the y-axis, and the skills of non-migrants that are along the x-axis. The migrants are always more skilled than the, than the non-migrants, but particularly in unskilled areas. And when you think about exit from the US, one of the reasons why you should worry is that the skilled people are actually leaving, making things even harder for the people who are left behind. OK, final, final point uh, about thinking about place-based policies. I only have three more slides. Um, so this is where I've, I've come to on, on place-based heterogeneity. And I don't know how this applies to Israel, because Israel is much smaller than the US. Um, but I do believe that while it doesn't make sense to engage in major place-based redistribution to try and induce people to move from New York to West Virginia, uh, and engaging in trying to game agglomeration economies is something we don't have the knowledge to do, but different conditions should mean different policies. So for example, we have a uniform national federal constru construction policy in the US. We encourage places to build using the low-income housing tax credit everywhere. It is crazy to have the same policy to encourage construction in New York, in Houston, and Detroit. New York desperately needs more housing. The, the gap between the, how much people value housing and the cost of housing is very large, okay? um, in which case having some form of subsidy is not crazy. Detroit, the last thing in the world Detroit needs is more housing. More than 90% of the homes in Detroit are, are valued wildly below the cost of construction. You don't want a housing subsidy there. You should use it for something else, like investing in schools or investing in safety. And Houston, Houston, the private market in Houston does a fantastic job of providing affordable housing. Right? Anyone who doubts 
that you know, the free market can't deliver cheap housing, just needs to go to Houston, right, where they provide enormously inexpensive housing for ordinary Americans in a vastly more effective way than anything that is done in the progressive parts of America. Um, similarly, right, hotspots policing. Most sensible police forces in the 21st century target their police officers where the problem is. They don't send them to safer neighborhoods. That's an obviously sensible thing. So let's analogize that to employment, right? So if we have a limited amount of employment subsidies, we should presumably then target it to those places where those subsidies are going to have the largest effect. And in my work on this together with Larry Summers and Ben Austin, right, we found that places that were, where joblessness was higher had a higher response of joblessness to wage shocks, to labor demand shocks, which at least suggests that targeting employment subsidies towards places which have higher levels of joblessness isn't a crazy thing to do. Um, you can do a nice version of this or a mean version of this, because my co-author Larry Summers is known for his niceness. I've, I've credited him with the, the nice version. The nice version just says you have an extra pot of money and you throw the extra pot of money towards West Virginia rather than towards Seattle. Um, the mean version, which I'm of course happy to take on myself, says we're not going to do anything that would encourage people to go to West Virginia. What we're going to do is we're going to tilt the benefit schedule. So for example, think within a social insurance program like disability. Disability insurance gives money to people who've had a health problem, but doesn't allow them to work. We know from the work of Magnus Mogstad that if you actually let people keep some of their earnings, even if they are disabled, they do a lot more work. So maybe in West Virginia, you allow the people to work more to keep more of their earnings, but you then reduce the base payment slightly to offset it. So you keep it, you keep it on net uh, flat. But the goal here is to respond to local conditions. Um, so what here is relevant in that view? So if, if I've come around to the view that, that you need, the American labor markets are so different that you need different policies towards them. Is that relevant for Israel? I'm not sure. A lot of Israel to me looks like there's one labor market, which makes it argue, harder to argue for spatial policy diversity. Moreover, your job market just looks a lot healthier than ours. Now, it is true that we still have a per capita GDP that's about 50% larger than yours. I'm not exactly sure how Americans you know, expect to be rich and as with the level of education sparsity that we have in many, many areas, but we have some legacy of wealth that continues. Um, your public policies are more sensible than ours in the sense that they do, they do less to discourage employment than ours do. And you know, from my perspective, please keep that up. Right? These, are, these are good things, and, and America should be a cautionary tale. If you were convinced that there were different you know, employment responses to investments in other areas, then there's a conceivable case for doing some form of added encouragement of employment in some areas other than others. But I'd want to know that that was true. Moreover, the dangers of subsidizing poorly performing places seem even larger than the US. Short distances mean that the ease of migration is higher in Israel. The, e the ease of actually commuting across areas are, are higher. Um, so I think that, that actually trying to pull employment into one area versus another seems like a, a more troubled path even here than in the US. There is, of course, a, a lot of case for doing something that's smart around locally designed policy. So let me throw out a couple of them that I think do make sense. One of which is uh, sort of local. Uh, innovation zones. So if you think about having a zone, like a Chinese economic zone, there's one design of the zone which says, I'm going to subsidize firms to locate in that area. I think that's by and large a mistake. There's another model which is I'm going to use this area to experiment with things and see if they actually work. And that actually makes a lot of sense to me. And let me throw out two types of experimentation that seem particularly relevant for the Israeli context. One of which is, Gene told us about the blimp and the city, right? these two economies. One of the differences between these two economies is that one is regulated in a very different way than the other. And I often, in the US context, I often say this by saying that I think it's deeply unfair that America regulates the entrepreneurship of rich people so much more lightly than it regulates the entrepreneurship of poor people. That if you want to start your internet phenomenon in your Harvard College dorm, no regulators will pay any attention to, to you until you've got a billion users and have possibly hacked an election. Um, if you want to start a grocery store that sells milk products in a poorer neighborhood in Boston, and this is true, you need 17 permits to get started on that. Right? That's a completely crazy thing. And this difference also appears to occur in, in Israel as well. Why not have something that feels more like one-stop permitting in particular areas? So there's one interface who has special skills for dealing with people with different languages or different cultural norms to try and make sure that whatever regulatory barriers you've put in place can be, under, uh, can be you know, undone in these areas. And we can get sort of more dynamism and more innovation in those areas. Similarly, if you're having an innovation district, 
education is clearly part of this. Uh, Nanjean mentioned this as well. But the difficulties, you know, particular areas have particular cultures. The difficulties of reaching out to those cultures and getting them into uh, vocational training, entrepreneurship training, technology training are difficult. We don't know how to do it. We need to experiment. And it's clear that we need to experiment recognizing the limits of our current knowledge. And uh, you know, we need to actually measure those things. So that means, I think, very much if you do in innovate, if you do try a new policy, and you don't evaluate it as best you can, ideally with a randomized controlled trial, remember it's like it never happened, because we won't actually learn whether or not it really worked or not. And the whole payoff from innovation is actually learning. So the crucial thing when one undergoes things like figuring out for uh, Arab Israelis, figuring out how to get them into the tech sector, is to actually do it in a randomized controlled trial way, in a way that you actually learn, do you have a thing that works? And sort of, I can imagine a world in which we're sort of constantly trying different policies with privately provided, publicly provided, nonprofit provided, union provided ways of providing skills, and we just are constantly evaluating them in particular areas. And that's a, that's a, a geographic policy, at least to me, that, that makes a certain amount of sense. Um, so uh, the place that I end up with is you know, trying to do whatever you're doing in terms of redistribution, targeting that to poor people, not to poor places. Right? But at the same time, ensuring more even educational opportunities and ones that actually reach out to provide tangible, useful skills in ways that are experimental and are targeted towards local geographic and cultural conditions. Infrastructure needs rigorous cost-benefit analysis always, always, always. Right? And usually the right answer is you're either going to pay for infrastructure with user fees, meaning the, u the riders actually use it, people pay for infrastructure with tolls, uh, or you're going to do it by building more up. And indeed, in some sense, the greatest hope for any of our cities for less congested streets is that we combine something like sensible congestion pricing, right? meaning that you actually have to pay to use the roads, with enough public public transit, maybe through VIA, so that poor people can get around without, uh, without actually having to pay for the congestion pricing. Right? So, so something that actually, actually moves towards an area. And if we move toward autonomous vehicles, we're just going to make congestion, pricing, congestion problems worse. Because autonomous vehicles reduce the cost of sitting in traffic. And, and this means actually more people are going to sit in traffic. The behavioral response problems with traffic are always huge. And if we don't actually institute the idea of pricing immediately, it's going to be a terrific pro challenge. Um, finally, we want to make sure that we're not locking people in place in underperforming areas. So while we do want to ensure education in those areas, we also want to make sure that people can move into better areas. And we're not creating barriers to building up, to enabling more affordable housing in the, in the Tel Aviv area or in San Francisco or in Boston. So those are, those, are, those are my remarks on this. But place is really important in determining the economy, but that doesn't necessarily mean you want strong place-based policies. It does mean that you want to make sure that you're taking care of allowing avenues of opportunity for everyone no matter where they're living. So thank you very much. Thank you.